Hey everyone and welcome back to The Leadership Project with your host Mick Spears. We bring you thought-provoking guests and topics every week to challenge your thinking about leadership. Our aim is to help you become the leader that you wish you always had as we learn together and lead together. Hey everyone and welcome back to The Leadership Project. I'm greatly honoured today to be joined by Jay Weiser. Jay is the principal and founder of Jay Weiser Consulting and he dedicates his work to two themes that we're going to cover today. The first one is about how individuals and teams and organisations can thrive in times of uncertainty. And the second is he's developed a model or framework around five leadership superpowers. And in today's discussion, I'm sure we're going to dip into both of those things. So Jay, without any further ado, please do introduce yourself to the audience and give us a flavor of your background and what inspired you into the type of work that you do today. So first of all, thank you, Mick, for having me. I'm excited to be here. So my background really started in strategy and thinking about how do organizations create value? How do they bring the different pieces of the organization together? And, you know, for that, I spent about 10 years in the area of balance scorecard, working with doctors, Kaplan and Norton, working with large companies from Tiffany to Bristol Myers Squibb, JP Morgan Chase, and private companies as well. Best forward to probably about five years ago, when I realized that companies were continually being disrupted. And the sad thing was they were always being caught off guard. You know, they never seemed prepared. They never seemed to see the things they should. And I started asking myself, you know, why is that? And it really came down to the need for leaders to see, think, and do differently, see things from different perspectives, being able to zoom in and zoom out, being able to think differently, different mental models, mindsets, frameworks, because times were changing. They were changing fast and the old ways were not necessarily working the way they used to. And ultimately doing something differently, you know, fast forward a couple more years, you know, as we got into 2019, 2020, you know, different economic issues, and then all of a sudden COVID hit. And that really accelerated change and disruption. It became really clear that companies were not prepared, not that they could have been prepared for COVID. COVID, but they could have been better prepared overall. And there were capabilities that I saw that were missing. And I saw it first as an opportunity for leaders to really get full value for their stakeholders, so not just shareholders, their customers, their employees. We know the world's changed. And there was a need to address that. There was a gap. And that's what led me to create, you know, you mentioned the five leadership superpowers, which is a, a framework to help leaders, not only through disruption and uncertainty like COVID or the economy, but even, you know, what I'll call little C crisis, a competitor move, you know, a customer, all of a sudden, largest customer saying they want to double in size. What are you going to do? So it's being prepared for those types of things. Yeah, you're really good, Jay. I want to unpack that in multiple ways. And I'll start with this first one. So the element of strategy and disruption. So, and we've got a a long litany of companies that you could say were disrupted out of existence, like some that didn't see the, the writing on the wall. They weren't able to read the tea leaves. Why do you believe from a strategy point of view, we've had this history that seems to be increasing now where people just don't see what's coming. Now, COVID, there are some Some people that will argue that pandemics happen every hundred years and we should have seen it coming, but let's put that in the list of things that no one saw coming, right? But in other circumstances, we see disruptions that if the executive were paying attention, they potentially could have seen it. So why do you think we get blindsided like that? Well, I think, first of all, you know, with the shareholder focus, with that performance focus, I think you almost get tunnel vision. I think people get enamored with their own products, their own services. The ego comes into play. You know, they're thinking about themselves. They're looking more inside than they are outside. I don't think they're necessarily in touch with the customers, whether or not they're paying enough attention to competitors. And I guess one of the big things, companies were doing, you know, three years 
their strategies, one year strategies. They do the strategy and they put it up on the shelves. And then when it comes, you know, then they're dealing with day to day operations. And that strategy very often is locked in for a year or two. And when you're in an environment where there's so much change, you have to, you know, tweak your course and adjust. And I think a lot of times, whether it was because of budgeting or the strategy cycle that was being locked in. So, you know, one comes back to timing, two comes back to, you know, ego and pride and getting complacent. But just because you're winning doesn't mean you're going to keep on winning. You know, I remember I was with an automotive online advertising company and we were always worried about what would happen if Google got into our business. Well, I wonder how much Google was wondering how much AI was going to get into their business. And all of a sudden now Google and the, the other search engines are being disrupted with AI. So, you know, everybody can be disrupted. And, you know, I think the other part, people talk a lot about, oh, all this great uncertainty. There's a lot of uncertainty that I would say is willful in the sense that it's because people aren't looking, they aren't asking the questions, they aren't following the signals. You know, the recent issue with banks in the U.S., Silicon Valley Bank, which I'm sure, you know, a lot of people have heard of, you know, people said, oh, that's a black swan. Well, no, not really. You know, it shouldn't have been to the people there. It shouldn't have been to the regulators. And, you know, for companies who put all their money in one basket, you know, common sense would say, you know, don't just work with one bank. And especially when you know above a certain level, you don't have insurance. So why not spread it around? So I wouldn't say that was a black swan. There's at least two things there, Jay, that I want to explore. But the first one is about this internal focus. So what I'm hearing, to be a little crass for a second, a tendency for companies to maybe believe their own BS, right? So their internal talk, they believe they're the best, they talk up a good game, et cetera, et cetera. And are they looking outside or not? Whether it's looking at potential disruptive competitors or a shifting marketplace where market needs, are they truly listening to their customers about what they're happy with, what they're not happy with, what the future of the industry that they're in is really looking for. I'm going to be pretty blunt here and love to give get your view on this one. Is this something that American companies are potentially more susceptible to? And the reason why I say this is there's a lot of positive psychology and almost toxic positivity in the United States where people beat their chest and they're positive and they stand up in share holder meetings and get this rah-rah going. I've spent a lot of my career working for European companies and European companies are a little bit more reserved than that. They are sometimes to the level of negativity and worry and concern, maybe sometimes overly concerned, but by doing so, they tend to take a little bit more of a conservative position around these things and then they get longevity. So how much of it is bravado, believing your own BS and over the positivity leading to the missing the signs that the market and the world is changing around them. So I think, you know, you've raised a couple of issues. I think the first thing, you know, this idea of positivity, transparency. I remember looking around the time of COVID at annual reports and seeing how companies were reporting risks. The European or Australian companies were being far more transparent in terms of what the risk was, how it related to a strategic driver and how those could work together, what they were doing about it. In U.S. companies, the only thing I saw was like a list. 20 things that, you know, we could have a breach, we could have a recession, we could have this. And, you know, item number 20, which included pandemics, was like anything else that could possibly happen. And it was very compliance focused versus being information focused. So I think in terms of transparency and how stuff is discussed, one. Two also goes to communications. You know, stuff gets filtered. And I'd say whether, I mean, this is global, but certainly in U.S., you you have the hierarchy. So if I'm at a lower level and I see something, I tell my boss and it goes up the chain, by the time it gets all the way up to the top, it's so diluted, it's meaningless and people are afraid to raise issues. So I think that communication does not get all the way up. And that's something that I, you know, when we get to talk about the superpowers, that openness, that curiosity, being open to debate, constructive conflict makes a big difference. You know, this idea we're Americans, we can do everything. You know, I think that 
that factors in. I don't know if that's, you know, a national thing, if that's, you know, a leader ego thing, but I think it all comes into play. And, you know, some of that I think has been driven by, you know, shareholder activism. You know, they want to pump up the price. They want to say things, you know, nobody wants to go into a presentation, uh, an investor presentation here. Hey, you know, we're under a lot of competition. We see things falling for a little bit. You know, that's like the black death, the ghost coming in. And, you know, while sometimes things need to be tempered, again, I think it goes to that transparency. You know, are we willing telling the investors? I think the other thing with European and Australian companies is when it comes to ESG, they, you know, stakeholder capitalism is recognizing there's more than one constituency. And, you know, I talk a lot about instead of either or thinking, think both and. And all these different components go together. If you don't address a lot of those other stakeholders, the shareholders are never going to win. So you really have to work, you know, all the levers together. There's definitely an element of that in both European and Australian New Zealand markets around ESG and people wanting to do businesses, do business with companies that have shared values and beliefs with themselves, etc. I definitely believe that's true. There's two other things that came out of uh, what you were just saying there, Jay. We were saying before about awareness and are we paying attention to the market around us, the competition, the customers. You brought up something really interesting. It's quite quite often our frontline workers who really do know what's going on, they've got their finger on the pulse, but are we listening to them? And you you mentioned about the communication and I know that we're going to come back to that in terms of whether we're creating the right environment where those messages from the field force are actually getting back and, and getting listened to and paid attention to. I want to unpack a little bit further around the shareholder element of this and ask whether part of it is the quarterly reporting. The fact that, you know, uh, listed companies are doing quarterly shareholder updates, annual general meetings, et cetera, et cetera. And the CEO's remuneration is quite often linked to whether the share price is, is increasing or not, et cetera. So not spooking the market with, hey, we think that there's a possibility that we've got disruption around the corner, either headwinds in the form of market disruption or a competitive force that we underestimated two years ago and now now they're a head-to-head competitor and we didn't see it coming. If you say that at a shareholder meeting and it's a surprise because it's surprises that shareholders don't like, and if that comes as a surprise, it, it will have an immediate impact on the share price and potentially an immediate impact on the remuneration of the CEO and the CFR. Is that part of the issue? Yeah, no, I think I think definitely. You know, one of the things we saw, uh, saw a lot with COVID was the leaders who were doing better were the ones who said, this is new to me too. I've not seen this before, but we together can figure this out. The ones who said, oh, don't worry, I have all the answers, weren't getting the information they needed. And, you know, you can fool people for a while. You go, you know, you go back to the BS, but eventually it's going to come back and get you. So if you're not facing facts and what's going on. You know, it's going to hurt. I think, you know, integrity, the truth, transparency is very important. And, you know, quarterly reporting, you know, very short term incentives, you know, I think make for perverse behavior. You know, I think not that I want to get into executive compensation, but having some things over the longer term. I've got a colleague who does a lot of work on what he calls sustainable leadership. And sustainable leadership is, you know, leadership that Last over time, not necessarily an individual. It can be a string of individuals instead of a CEO coming in, bringing in their own people, changing things. After a couple of years, they disappear. Somebody else comes in, breaks everything down, starts all over. You know, and the cycle continues. It's not additive. It's not you know growing from from a knowledge of you know from a learning standpoint. It's not building up that pipeline of future leaders. So I think having that longer term perspective. You know, the other thing, you know, I wrestle with a lot is I would say if an investor is valuing a company, they need to be thinking about the long term. So I've always been puzzled a little bit when executives do a certain amount of window dressing, you know, so pumping up things in the short term, make the books look good. So when they get acquired, they get a higher price. Now, conversely, the folks who are buying 
I wonder sometimes if they're doing enough due diligence in terms of understanding what's happening inside the organization. So not just looking at the numbers, looking at the people, looking at how things work, because if they did that, I think they'd see where some of the fooling around is happening. And that hopefully would lead to better behavior because they're not going to, you know, if if they're only thinking in the short term, they're detracting from long term value. And if I'm a buyer, I don't want to pay as if things are going to continue when I know they fix things in the short term. I'll definitely come back to this long term view later. I've got a specific question in mind when we get into some of this balancing act that I think we need here. I want to reflect on what you were saying before about COVID. And what I'm hearing is the executives that showed a bit of humility, that showed a bit of transparency, that created that environment that information could be shared openly, are then the ones could then become curious and find, okay, so what options do we have here? What can we do? What can we do with what we've got from where we are instead of just being, come back to the word bravado, I've got all the answers, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. All right, very good. And I know that we're going to come back to that for sure. The next thing I want to unpack is something you mentioned earlier was a lot about responsiveness. So if our antenna is there to be aware of disruption and disruptive forces in our market, headwinds, competitors, shifting customer bases, etc., the second second part is what happens when the disruption does hit and how responsive we can be. How much, and you spoke about one year and three year strategy cycles before, how much of it of this is just the ability to be agile and when something happens, being able to do small course corrections to adapt to your environment, which is changing at a faster rate than it ever has in history. How much of it is about adaptability and responsiveness? Yeah, no, no, I I agree. Uh, You just said it, adaptability. It's having an organization that can sense and respond that, you know, for example, if you you have a very hierarchical structure and, you know, person on the front line senses something and then it's going to be communicated up multiple levels, you're not going to be very responsive if there is open communication and there's that flow. So it becomes a more intelligent organization, then it can respond much faster and it develops so-called the responsiveness muscle, which is important, you know, slow to react is really dangerous or deciding not to act as well. So I think part of it's the flow of information. Part of it is, you know, where where does decision making take place? Is it closer to the customer? Are people enabled and empowered to respond? I think moving from a rules-based culture to a principles-based culture, rules are not meant for multiple different situations. It's applying, you know, what one size fits all, where if it's principle based, employees, leaders throughout the company are empowered to adapt to make course corrections as long as they follow that general principle. So, you know, I think part of it's the culture, part of it's communication, part of it is where decisions get made. Part of it is allowing for a learning environment that, you know, we might make a response, it might not work. Well, what can we learn from it and what can we do with it? You know, I think, um, I'm sure you've heard of WD-40, the lubricant. Everybody has it around the world. The blue and yellow can. Gary Ridge, their CEO, recently retired. He was there like 30 years. They banned the word failure and they talked about learning moments. So in a lot of companies, if somebody makes a mistake, all of a sudden it's like, you know, you've got a target on your back and you have to live with all the repercussions versus a company where it's seen as a learning moment. It's not punitive. We learn and we move forward. You know, somebody said, if if you don't give people permission to fail, you don't give them permission to try. And in that type of environment, if people are going to be punished, they're like, well, why should I do this? You know, let somebody higher up make the decision. Whereas if you have that permission, you can actually respond, listen to a customer and adjust. WD-40 is a great example because it's in the name. Uh, WD-40 stands for water displacement number 40. It was the 40th recipe. They they failed 39 times before they got to the, the golden recipe of 40. So the two things I took away from that, Jay, were one was structural related to empowerment and enablement the, and the principles 
but rather than giving someone a bunch of rules that they've got to follow, you're giving them guiding principles as to in any situation, you can go to this credo, you can go to these guiding principles and let that be your conscience that helps you make a decision, a more rapid decision, a more adaptable and responsive decision. Then the second part was then the learning cycle. So do you have a culture that does when we're doing these little pivots all right. So instead of having a locked in strategy for three years that we do pivot and navigate challenging waters, are we learning every time? So we, we try something and go, okay, that didn't quite work, but what did we learn from it? Instead of just dumping it and going, well, that didn't work. We went, okay, what did we learn from that? And what will we do differently next time when we do go again? And that probably leads me to this question around long-term view and how we balance persistence and resilience with adaptability and the ability to change. Because, I mean, one of the things about strategy, if we change our strategy every day, we also won't get anywhere, right? So having a a strategy that's too rigid is a recipe for failure. But if we change our strategy every day, we're also not going to have the persistence to be able to see any results come. So how do we balance persistence and resilience versus adaptability and flexibility? So I guess, you know, when I think about the types of changes, changes are are tweaks, they're course corrections. It's not like we're going to go north. That's our strategy. And now we're going to go south. I'm not I'm not advocating that. But the thing is, you know, we're going north. And, you know, let's just say I'm I'm going to expose myself to geography errors. But, you know, we're going north directly up versus, you know, a couple of degrees over, a couple of degrees over, recognizing there are options. Obstacles we might have to go around, we might have to adjust for. We might have to challenge our assumptions. And based on the assumptions that are underlying the strategy we put together, if you change the assumptions, that might lead to some tweaking. So we're not talking about radical, complete changes, but we're talking about being responsive to the market. So it's about being directionally correct. It's about thinking about, you know, where that destination is, who you want to be over the long term, there are multiple paths to get there. Very rarely is it a straight line, which is the way a lot of strategies come out is, oh, we're going to go from here to here. And the shortest path is a straight line. Well, that rarely works. So it's having that flexibility. I think, you know, the other part, you know, resilience comes in in persistence is important for direction. Persistence and focus on a set of prescribed steps that doesn't allow for adaptability to circumstances, you know, I think is a recipe for disaster. So the question is, what's the degree that's locked in? And compared to, you know, go back 20 years, 30 years, you could lock certain things in for a longer period of time. Now, what you can lock in is much smaller. The world's interconnected. There's so many interdependencies that there's a lot you have to be more flexible with. Budgeting, for example, companies would set a budget for the year and come hell or high water, the focus was going to be on the budget. No matter what happened, you have to stick with the budget and they you know, focus on variances. Whereas now the companies who are more progressive or more successful or making in-year adjustments. They're recognizing, you know, the budget they set out, which is, you know, what, we're now in April. So people start setting budgets in July, August, September for what's going to happen in January. And we know the world's going to be different in January. So all this time, time is put in to build budgets, which are useless by the time it comes around. So Again, it's having a more adaptive approach and just not locking too many things in. So there's a number of things that are popping into my head, Jay. So the, the first one is the famous Einstein quote of doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is a definition of insanity. But then I'm also thinking of a famous quote, and I actually can't remember who this one came from, but if you don't know where you are and you don't know where you're going, um, a map is not going to help. So what I'm then hearing here is directionally, we need to know what our North Star is. So what is our purpose? What is our mission? What is the impact that we're trying to have on the world? With some level of clarity of the vision of that directionally, 
directionally, not how are we going to get there or are we going to turn left, are we going to turn right, but where are we headed? And then coming back to our structure that we spoke about before, empowering and enabling your teams to be able to have the guiding principles, the values and beliefs and the direction that they're heading towards so that they can make little micro decisions along the way that when they do come across a boulder, either a boulder that was foreseeable or a boulder that was not foreseeable, that they know, okay, what are we going to do? Are we going to try and go through the boulder? Are we going to try and go around the boulder? Are we going to try and go over the boulder? We've got some guiding principles that you said before. We've got our direction that is going to drive us forward to make sure that we don't give up and we're going to have a learning culture along the way so that we're adapting adaptable enough to make the most of it. How does that sit with you? No, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. Because, I mean, that kind of sets the guardrails. You know, I very often when use a vacation analogy, you know, family planning a trip. You know, there is, we're going to go to the mountains and we're going to stop at these different places along the way. Well, you know, what if there's a roadblock? Okay. So staying in the spirit of we want to do stuff outside, then, you know, we might take, you know, reroute our trip so we can do something. Well, what happens? All of a sudden it starts storm. Okay. So now we we want to do something fun with the kids. What can we do inside? We're still heading to the same place, but where we stop and how we get there is different. And and it also goes to, you know, how do we prepare for the trip, you know, in terms of, you know, what do we pack? What do we bring? What can we get when we're there? You know, it's, it's the same type of thing with the company. You know, if you try and pack everything initially, when you're going to be carrying too much. If you're only packing stuff for sunny weather, well, what happens if it rains? And, and it's the same thing when you think about a company, you know, in terms of having some of that base level of flexibility. Yeah, very good. All right. So that's a great metaphor. I like the vacation one. It's a good example. And you do need to make little micro decisions along the way if if it doesn't go exactly as planned. So let's now transition to your five leadership superpowers and how they come to play in this ability to be able to survive and thrive through adversity and through disruption. So with the five leadership superpowers, and I'll step back for a second, you can be doing all the best practices around strategy, execution, communications, but you can still be surprised. And I started asking myself, why is that? What aren't we doing? And the first thing, you know, I mentioned the need to see, think, and do differently. The second thing is not to look at things as binary choices. I can do this or that, but think from a both and perspective. How do I bring two things? things together that might seemingly seem opposite, but together you can get more information. You can be more innovative, come up with different solutions than just this or that. So the superpowers look at five distinct tensions and there's superpower for each one. The first one is being a present futurist. So it's about better understanding the present more robustly and thinking about the future. What if scenarios, paying attention to signals, looking at trends, combining that information together so you can make better decisions that work in the short and long term. If you only focus on one, then they're downsized because you're not paying attention to the other. You need to do both. The second one is the tension between experience and expertise in learning. So a lot of people, you know, senior executives would say, oh, I've been a CFO for 20 years. I know what to do. Well, you haven't been in this situation before. So you have to be open to recognizing one, challenging your assumptions, your models, being open to other people challenging you, being curious, asking questions, recognizing that just because you've been a CFO for 20 years does not mean you should be done learning. And it's creating an environment where learning is fostered, learning capabilities, learning agility is something that's fostered. So it's finding the balance. Doesn't mean you throw out all the experience, but recognize it's not all relevant and foster that curiosity, engage your people in that discussion. The third one is prepared risk taker. So first of all, when things get rough, you hit a bump in the road, you know, you get a, a crisis, all of a sudden rising fuel prices. The first reaction for most companies is to go on the defense, focus on loss avoidance. Well, defense doesn't 
score points. Offense does. Risk taking is part of business. You want to do it smartly. You want to do it in measured ways, pilots, experiments, you know, fail fast and forward. Preparedness at the same time, people say, oh, you know, why should I invest in preparedness for something that will never happen? Well, it's not so much about specific risks, but it's about being one risk aware. You know, are you paying attention to it's not isolated risks anymore? You can't just say, well, what if it's a cyber breach or what if it's a rise in fuel prices? What if it happens all at once? You know, we're now in a world where all these crises, I mean, you think about Ukraine, you think about fuel prices, you think about supply chain issues, you know, geopolitical alliances, recession, you know, all these things are happening at the same time. So you have to think about those interdependencies and not just looking, you know, we talked earlier about being focused inward at your company. You've got to consider your ecosystem, your industry and the macro environment that you play in. And it's also, you know, base level of preparedness. For example, I'm willing to bet like we have in the U.S. and Australia, whether you're in Singapore, you know, in your house, you probably have a smoke detector, a carbon monoxide detector. Since COVID, you might have a few extra rolls of toilet paper. You keep some food in the pantry. You have some extra water. You maybe have an emergency contact list or someplace you go to gather your family to be safe. Well, what's the corporate equivalent of that? So that's prepared risk taker. Fourth is strategic executor. So balancing strategy and operations. You know, again, when a crisis hits, there's a tendency to only focus on the here and now. And, you know, we'll get to the future when things calm down. I don't know about you, but I don't see things calming down anytime soon. So it's recognizing that decisions you make in the short term can affect the long term. You know, if you cut to the bone in a emotional reaction without thinking, you're not protecting your future. And that makes a big difference. So it's balancing that short and long term. It's recognizing that operations inform strategy, strategy informs operations. Fifth is accountable collaborator. So it's recognizing strategy is a team sport. It's not about individuals. It's about working across functions, across business units, even working outside the organization with your partners, your suppliers, your community. And that collaboration is so important. But at the same time, it's having accountability with a focus on outcomes. So I like to use, so I'll be a little nat- nationalistic for a moment, the U.S. women's soccer team. When you think about soccer, it's not about the individual. It's about how that team works together. It doesn't matter, you know, I had the ball more, I kicked more, you know, I ran further or faster than you did. What matters is, do you score the outcome and do you win? So it's focused on the team and it's focusing on delivering results, not all this activity that, you know, the fact that I had the ball more and I kick more. If the team doesn't win, it doesn't matter. So it's being accountable for outcomes and the team's empowered to make those decisions on the field. So they're accountable for outcomes. They're given the latitude to make decisions in terms of how they achieve those outcomes. So those are the five. Now, what's interesting, the five reinforce, inform and support one another. So I'd like to build on that, particularly the last one. So I heard essentially things that could be seen as paradoxes, right? So balancing acts between present and future, between operations and strategy, between experience and learning. There's a lot of paradoxes in there. But that last one where you're bringing up about collaborative accountability and strategy being a team sport, I think history has shown us very clearly the power of a superstar team versus a team of superstars and that ability to work with each other. So that's what I'd like to unpack now. When you talk about these superpowers, are you talking about collectively the organization, collectively the executive leadership team, or are you talking about these superpowers being in in the seat of the CEO? So let's pick present futurist as an example. You have these types of leaders where you'll say someone is very good at execution 
execution and like we could have used strategy and execution here on this one, but very good at execution, very good at the here and now delivering on what we've got in front of us. And then there's other leaders that are visionary leaders. There's some CEOs that even call themselves, they rename themselves, I'm the chief visionary officer, right? So sometimes you don't have this in one person. There might be a COO who is exceptional at the present and the CEO being exceptional at the vision and the future. Is this what I'm hearing from you, Jay, that it's not one person, it's across your executive leadership team, you need to have these five paradoxes covered? So I think a couple of things. I tend to look at from an individual perspective, an individual probably needs to become proficient at one to three. A leadership team collectively needs to have all five. And I think it's important if I only have, so let's just say I'm the chief human resources officer, and I'll, I'll just make a generalization here. I would hope that person is an accountable collaborator because they have to work across teams. Teams, they have to work with you know other functions. That's the type of culture you're trying to build. And it's also about being an experienced learner in terms of training and development, the culture, curiosity. But I still want that person to acknowledge present and future and be receptive to listening to those discussions and contributing. The same thing about strategy or about risk taking, but that's not going to be their primary focus. So when that team comes together by having a five ultimately it might you know it might not be today but they start to reduce the number of blind spots and they can have those productive discussions so you know I don't I don't think there's anybody who really has all five I mean if I think about myself you know I think about experienced learner prepared risk taker and strategic executor those are my strengths I know there are people who you know our present futurists and are very good at you know market research, understanding trends and what's going on with customers today. But they can also you know focus on seeing forward. So you know everybody's going to have their strengths. And you know the other thing you ask is not just at the top in the organization; it's through the organization. It has to start though. I think at the top, whether the C level, the board level, it's very hard if you're in a you know, hierarchical command and control environment. If you're, you know, towards, you know, you're the front line and you're in the middle, it's very hard to make those changes without that sea level support because it'll get, it'll get shut down and people will get frustrated. It's not impossible, but it's very, very hard to do. All right. Very, very clear. I like the answer and I take your point about flowing down into the organization. Let's focus though on the ELT for now. So what I'm hearing is you'd hope that members of the ELT have probably got strengths across three of the five, but collectively you've got all five bases covered. What tips do you have then to ensure that the environment is created where that balance comes to the fore, where you have co-creation? And how do you make sure that either the most senior person, let's say, the CEO or the most charismatic person or the most influential person or the most, sometimes I'll just say it how I see it in some boardrooms, the loudest person that their personality is the one that wins through. How do we create that environment where everyone's superpower becomes the co-creation and we become greater than the sum of our parts rather than the sum of our weaknesses? So I think part of this is building awareness of what happens if you don't. You know, I I think, you know, there's a tendency, again, to go back to what worked before. You know, it's thinking, again, I go back to strategy being a team sport. It's recognizing that, you know, we're all in the same boat together. And if the hole's under your seat and I say, oh, Mick, that's your problem. You got to fix that hole. Well, I'm in the boat. I'm going to sink just like everybody else. It's not your problem. It's our problem. So I think it's one, recognizing that. I think two, I think part of my, I say my job, my mission is to help folks become more aware. You know, are you tired about being surprised? Are you tired about being 
being caught off guard. It hurts. It's stressful. It hurts the organization. You know, if you're only thinking either or, your thinking is constrained, you're not engaging your people, and there's a price that you pay. You know, people talk about, why don't we ever learn? You know, we go through a crisis, we learn, all of a sudden, you know, things are flying along fine, and we start to get complacent. The cycles are becoming much shorter. The crises and uncertainty, you know, it's constantly changing. The market, I think, is going to be very unforgiving to the companies who don't become more adaptive and more agile. The margin for error is going to be smaller. There's always going to be somebody who's thinking about this and they're going to eat your lunch if you're not. So, you know, I think part of this is building that awareness. Part of it is recognizing it's a team sport. Part of it's a hiring decision. You know, when boards start to think about what kind of leaders do I want to have? What capabilities do I need in a CEO and a CFO, a CHRO that are, can work in this type of environment, which is why I brought up the board tech. Because boards are having to figure out how to how to guide, how to advise oversight in this type of environment. So, you know, I think that message is starting to be heard. There was a DDI study that I recently posted on. They're an international organizational HR research organization. And they said the top three CEO concerns all related to people around leadership, around engagement. And the third item is escaping me. Then they talked about digital transformation, supply chain, all these different things. And I think it was finally the recognition that you have to address those top three to solve all the other problems. Now, expressing concern is different than acting. And we've got to move from not just saying people are important to acting like people are important and making those adjustments and those course corrections. I love this metaphor about the hole in the boat, regardless of whose seat it's under. Guess what? We're all in the boat. That's a really powerful one. And then with this recruiting of the people into the team in the first place, looking for that balance. If we employ an executive leadership team of 12 people and they've all got a similar profile, similar backgrounds, similar strengths, that's not going to serve us well. And that's when we're going to develop blind spots. So it goes beyond diversity of thought. It's diversity of everything, diversity of profile, diversity of strength, diversity of experience, diversity of background, all of these things add up to having a richer executive leadership team that you then need to create an environment where everyone is willing to co-create together, not be one superstar in the in the ELT that dominates everyone else, but everyone holding space for each other and co-creating. Well, I think like you said, it's not a team of superstars. It's a superstar team. And it's that dynamic between the team members that makes the difference. All right. Brilliant, Jay. This has been a wonderful conversation. Uh, There's many takeaways here around foreseeability, but also around preparedness. And what I was taking from your message there around preparedness is not just being able to foresee the changing world around you, but also have a level of preparedness that for things that you didn't foresee, but they're going to happen anyway. And I, I do like the idea about the larder of, you know, you might have a stock of food in your house. You don't know if there's going to be a flood, a cyclone, a hurricane or a famine or, you know, another pandemic where the supermarkets close. It doesn't matter what the incident is. You're at least prepared. And you also bring up things like, okay, saying to the family, if something happens, this is where we're going to meet. You know, that's preparedness for something that maybe you haven't foreseen. And then having this responsiveness to be able to respond to things more quickly, having directionally an idea of where you're going, having guiding principles that help you make micro decisions decisions along the way. And it's that ability to implement some of that prepared risk taking as you go along the journey. And then having a balance in your team across those five superpowers to make sure that you've got all of the bases covered and you've got an environment where everyone can contribute. Absolutely wonderful, Jay. I really enjoyed this conversation and the takeaways from theirs. I'd love now to take us to our rapid round. So these are the same four questions that we ask uh, all of our guests. The first one is, what's the one thing you know now that you wish you knew when you were 20? 
I think really the thing for me there is adaptability. You know, what's interesting, my dad worked for the U.S. Navy uh, civil service for 40 years. All of his friends were in these long-term jobs. And, you know, people in my generation and our generation, future generations, they switched jobs. You know, I'll never forget on my first job, I was in banking, corporate lending, and I was put in our media and telecommunications department. So I actually learned about Rupert Murdoch back in the 1980s, about three weeks into that role, the head of the department left and went someplace else. And I'm like, this happens? You know, he was the head of the department. Why would he leave? You know, what's going to happen to us was realizing that you've got to be adaptable. You've got to be flexible. Success comes in a variety of different ways. So, you know, I think my entire career in the projects that I've worked on, the people I've worked with, it's all been about change. It's all been about adapting. It's all been about, you know, how do you adjust? Nothing, nothing is fixed anymore. Mm, powerful lesson there and very aligned with everything we've discussed today, Jay. So I'm not so not so surprised that that's coming from you and that is something for us all to think about. And yes, the world has changed. It's changed at a pace, an unprecedented pace. It changes quicker now than it ever has. But the scary part is it's today it's changing slower than it ever will in the in the future, right? So this is a, a runaway train and we need to be ready to be flexible and run with it. All right, brilliant. What's your favorite book? So, so I was thinking about this, and I actually have two. So I've always loved Tom Clancy. So these were all these geopolitical conflicts. But you start to realize there's so many variables at play. It's about seeing things not just from your side, but from other sides. The dynamic, the suspense, the thrill. You know, and seeing that things aren't simple. You know, there's that complexity, but there are people who, you know, who learn to work in that complexity because they're looking at the whole thing. They're seeing the impact of their actions. And, you know, I've always, you know, loved politics, you know, international affairs. And, you know, I think, you know, that's kind of a microcosm or macrocosm for, you know, what goes on in the corporate world and the nonprofit world in terms of all the different forces. The other one is a book I just came across recently. And this is on the nonfiction work side. It's a book called The Workplace Curiosity Manifesto, and it's all about the power of curiosity and fostering curiosity and why people are curious in an environment where curiosity is encouraged. I think all too often, you know, we're most curious when we're kids, when we're young. And then as we go through school, it's about having the answer. And I think we get less and less curious as we get older, and it's important You know, successful leaders are the ones who have not stopped being curious, who are asking questions. I mean, I talk to my kids who are, you know, now in their 20s. My wife's an educator. They see us reading all the time. My son just told me he read four books in a month. And it's that desire to learn, to know, to understand, ask questions. You know, it helped me understand myself in terms of, you know, my continuous curiosity and how that can be used. For good. I'm going to bring those two together there, Jay, and talk about the person that I see sitting in front of me right now. So if I, if I unpack that a little bit and talk about Tom Clancy, and yes, what you're talking about there is multifactorial complex decision making where there's always more than one version of the truth. And it's that empathy to be able to see the world through someone else's eyes and someone else's perspectives. And then if I add your second book and talk about curiosity, curiosity is where empathy takes us. So if we can start with empathy to stop and to be able to put ourselves in someone else's shoes, the next thing we need to do is embrace curiosity to understand, not just see, but understand that there is more than one perspective to any problem, whether it be in business or geopolitics, there's always more than one perspective of that same thing. And it's curiosity that's going to help us find those perspectives. Yeah, really powerful, Jack. What's your favorite quote? 
Yeah, I think you're going to see a pattern here, and that is I never have just one answer. I think there's two. One is from F. Scott Fitzgerald, and he talks about paradox. And he said the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind and still function. And, you know, I think that gets to the both-and thinking. The second one is Alvin Toffler, and his quote was, the illiterate of the 21st century will not not be those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Oh, I love both of those. And, and this curiosity is still the constant theme in all of that. That's wonderful, Jay. Okay, so finally, uh, I'm sure there's going to be people listening to this show that are intrigued by you, intrigued by the work that you do, and probably thinking about their own lives, their own teams, their own organizations and going, oh, you know what, we sound like we make some of those mistakes that Jay's talking about. How do people find you if they would like to know more or take advantage of your services? Sure. So in terms of services, you know, I do public speaking. I offer training around the superpowers. How do you thrive in disruption and uncertainty? I do organizational assessments. You know, I think it's important to understand where you are, where you want to go, and we can talk about what do you need to get there. And last, I'm in the process, uh, you know, of writing a book. Very early in the process, we're working on an outline. Now, people can reach me at J, J Y at jweiser, J-Y-W-E-I-S-E-R.com. I post a lot on LinkedIn. So if you look up for J-R Weiser, you can find me there. I offer a 45-minute discovery call to, you know, we can talk about your situation, talk about where you're going, and we can explore, you know, can I help? You know, this is a journey that leaders don't have to take alone. It's something they need to own. It's not something I can do for you, but I can help guide and enable because I've done this with a lot of organizations. And, you know, my goal is to transfer those skills so you have sustainable capabilities to thrive in the future. Brilliant, Jay. All right. We'll also put those links in the show notes as well to make it easier for people to find that. So thank you so much for your time today and, and for your wisdom and knowledge and for sharing with us your reflections around how to make the most of uh, uncertainty and to thrive in an uncertain world and to introduce us to the five leadership superpowers. Greatly appreciate it. Loved our discussion today. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for the opportunity. I have really enjoyed this as well. Thank you for listening to The Leadership Project at mixbeers.com. A huge call out to Faris Sadek for his video editing of all of our video content and to all of the team at TLP. Joanne Goes On, Gerald Calabo and my amazing wife, Say Spears. I could not do this show without you. Don't forget to subscribe to The Leadership Project YouTube channel where we bring you interesting videos each and every week. And you can follow us on social, particularly on LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram. Now, in the meantime, please do take care, look out for each other and join us on this journey as we learn together and lead together.